Thank you, Alex. I'm just going to share my screen so we can get going. All right, let me know if you can see my screen. Cool. Um, so today we're going to be talking about content operations. Um, and there's, before we begin, I, I wanted to just quickly draw your attention to this one thought that um, it's really been uh, intriguing for me. Uh, just one more. Just trying to see. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah. So this this is the thought. Um, so I've been reading, listening to a lot of Derek Sivers, and um, his he talks a lot about ideas versus execution. And this one thought really stuck with me, which is that ideas are just a multiplier of execution. Um, and what I'm trying to show you here is this, look at this table and this is a great way to visualize what he's trying to say. So, um, in this, oops, I think I'm getting, oh, <laughs> all right, yep. <laughs> um, and in this table, you see the left side shows you, um, just a grading system for ideas from minus one to 20. And on the right side of the table, you have, um, different levels of execution. And Derek Sivers takes this idea and then he extrapolates that to business and he says that a brilliant idea without any execution is obviously not great for business, but a brilliant idea is only viable if you couple that with brilliant execution. Now, why I'm talking so much about execution is also the reason why companies and agencies and content experts or teams like us aren't afraid to talk about our results. Um, no one's really hiding anywhere and no one's, no one's saying that, you know, it's, um, it's, it's difficult um, to not share because it is easy to share. It's easy to share results. And I always talk about how, you know, Nexiva grew from say around uh, 10,000 monthly visits to say 100,000 in the first six months of be, me being there on the content team, or you see, you know, omniscience, a lot of uh, case studies. I was, I think I was reading the localized case study the other day. The reason why companies aren't afraid to talk about their results is because the, it's not the tools that they use. It's not the, um, uh, the keyword research uh, sheets that they prepared or like the, um, uh, the teams that they've built that help them do this. It's actually in the execution of how everything gets done. And now I want to show you um, a, a quick, um, just a screenshot of where Nextiva is at today. And this is far from where we were when we began. Um, I just kind of blurred out our competitors. I don't want to give them free PR, but um, if you look at this, I, and also this is a screenshot from SEMrush. So full disclosure, these are estimates. These are not accurate numbers, but we are second on this list of our top competitors in terms of organic traffic. I know organic traffic gets a lot of flack because it's not a, it's not a tangible result enough for C-level executives. It doesn't translate directly or isn't directly proportional to uh, the revenue that it brings in just because organic traffic goes up does not mean that uh, your MQLs go up proportionately. But having said that, uh, between 2018 and 2021, um, the content team and Nextiva, we overhauled our entire system that we built in order to publish any piece of content, be it a landing page, um, you know, a YouTube video, um, say a blog post, all of that is the way we produced it entirely changed. And I think it's probably in the best shape it has ever been in. Of course, it has room for improvement. And, and this is why this topic is so close to my heart. And that's I think it's a good segue into just defining what content operations is. Content operations is everything that you do to plan, produce, distribute, and optimize content. Uh, now, there's a, again, within this world, there's a lot of misconception that uh, content operations means just these few things. And these are infamous documents, right? Almost all content teams on the planet are aware of these. You've got your voice and tone guides, your keyword research sheets, or your content calendars. These are, these are the fundamentals of any content marketing team. And that's what I've listed here too. But content operations is not just that, it's so much more. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of all the different roles or components inside of content operations. But I like to believe that these are some of the key components that we've found to be helpful and we've found to invest more in as we've grown. Um, I'm just using this one, um, slide to just kind of show you if you don't already know what these different elements mean. Um, 
The funny thing about this too, and I'm just gonna go back um, a little here. With the content style guide, um, that's usually a brand driven document um, with keyword research. Most often companies, for example, companies on either ends of the spectrum, if you're a large enterprise or if you're a company that's just getting started with their content, you tend to lean on external agencies to help you with this. Your ideal customer profile, it's always a top down kind of a thing. If you're, if you're a small company, your CEO or your, um, your exec team decides what target you're going after. If you're a larger company, you'd, you'd have dedicated product marketing teams that define that. An editorial calendar is probably one of those documents that the content team has full ownership over. And the content org is everybody that you hire to hold people, to hold themselves accountable for every piece of these uh, of this system. Content tech is all the tools that you would use. Um, and it's, it, it's not just the SEO tools, it's also the tools that you would use to edit and prune your content, to amplify your content. Um, that sometimes includes social monitoring. Content briefs, one of my favorite topics to talk about and something we'll dive into a little further down the line. On-page SEO checklist, again, an infamous topic uh, within the SEO world, everybody loves talking about it. Design and dev intake. This is also very close to my heart. It's one of those skills that I think is so crucial um, within larger content marketing teams, just because you can't work like a little um, unit anymore. You need to be really good at communicating what you need, when you need it and how you need it with these different teams and helping them do that is just as important as your content brief for your writers. Link partnerships um, to amplify your content, content performance, because hey, we can't just rely on net new content all the time. Existing content packs a ton of SEO equity. Content optimization, because Again, it makes sense to go back and tweak something just like how we say upselling is more lucrative than getting a new customer from scratch. If you're still wondering why content operations matter, I have four reasons for you. The number one being better content quality. When you have things where it needs to be with clear accountability, things are just gonna be of better quality. Um, just like how you don't need a scramble last minute to get things done. Uh, and the, one of the simplest example I can think of is you have a blog ready to go, but you don't have the featured image ready or the design team didn't get enough time to prepare a good featured image, then that's gonna affect quality. Faster production cycles, because there's clear visibility into everything that needs to happen. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna stress on feedback loops here a little bit because especially within larger teams, and again, I'm gonna take the example, uh, and I'll show you an illustration towards the end of uh, my deck, but we rely a lot on design and development and product marketing and sometimes even subject matter experts to help us produce good content because content is not just articles or written content, it's all types of content. And when we do that, the best way to help them do better work in the future is to go back and show them how something that they worked on performed. And so faster production cycles when you do have a good system in place, meaningful and ROI driven, there is no place for um, you know, I, I, and this is where I'd love to use Omniscient's example of uh, product-led content, buzzworthy content, or evergreen content. Um, everything needs to have a purpose. If you're, if you're building it for backlinks and get that clear, mention that on the brief, talk about that's where, you know, extra ammunition needs to go into promotion and partnerships. If you're building it for the product-led purpose, then let, you know, get your product team excited about it, get them to contribute a ton. And so every piece of content that you put together in your content operations engine needs to have a reason for existence. It's a competitive advantage. It is, this is one of my favorite reasons why uh, that I tend to double down on content operations. Not everybody does it, not everybody is good at it. And this is not just important to fine tune your existing system. We found it that it's so much more easier to plug in somebody when they're just getting onboarded or they've, they've newly joined the team when you have repeatable process that you have documented. Now, this is just a, a Gantt chart view of what, it's, it's oversimplified obviously, of what the content operation system looks like. Um, so that's before publishing, during and after, you see all of these 12 elements working together. We obviously don't have time to dive into everything. So I'm gonna touch upon these four things within, uh, within this system. The first one's content org. Just like anything in SEO, um, I, need to, I need to give this uh, sort of a, a, a premise that it's, it's, it depends. It depends on your team size, where your company is at with their content marketing maturity, how much budget you have, 
But there are a few reasons why I think this lean structure works. Of course, there are, you know, just again, to give you some more context, Nexiva is a little over 1,500 people. Um, we have uh, around three different flagship products that we have been selling. We've been growing at around 25% year over year revenue wise, fully bootstrap company. And yet most of the SEO driven content comes from these nine different people working together or nine different elements working together. And another reason why I love this system is that everybody, if you notice, has their own dedicated lanes. There's very little intersection of expertise. Um, you know, your technical SEO person's doing their thing. Content SEO is focused on bringing all this together. Designers, marketing engineers, subject matter experts, link partnerships, in-house and external agencies. And in case you do wanna look closely at some of my definitions of what this role does, this is it. And I'm not gonna go deeper into it just yet. But one of the most common questions that I get asked uh, by you know, early stage startups or even sometimes companies that have not yet invested in SEO content is who do we hire first? Or, hey, I've hired a bunch of really amazing writers. Uh, they've, they've got their work on you know, all these large publications with extremely high domain authority and they're gonna get started tomorrow. And I keep telling them, you know what? You can, that's setting yourself up for failure because that's not the role you need to hire for. The role you need to hire for first is called a lot of things, but it's the content editor role. Um, and this role is, I think, or my role today, which is the content SEO role, is kind of an evolved version of the content editor role. And my case for people needing to um, hire for this role first is exactly this illustration. If you look at what needs to be done in order to publish one blog post and you're looking at the writing tasks versus non-writing tasks, we're talking about a five tasks versus 20 tasks. So if you are going to bring on only uh, a writer or multiple writers who may be amazing at their craft, they're not gonna be able to do more than a few things on this list. And that's not gonna help you publish something that's successful, something that's user-friendly and search-friendly, and you can tie back down to a business goal. And this is a quick look at what that, you know, all of those different things, writing as well as non-writing tasks look like within our project management system. We use Asana and um, while I'm not an expert in all things uh, content operations automation, Tommy Walker, who's gonna be following me after this session is going to dive into that. But Asana is pretty robust when it comes to helping you get started with automation. Um, there's a ton of stuff that you can play around with. And this is just the one ticket that shows you what goes on uh, behind scenes uh, of getting a blog out. You've got your overview with like all the basic things that need to be there, assignee, you've got your due date, projects, dependencies, on page SEO aspects outline, conversations about you know, what the team feels about this particular topic or what we need to do with subtasks with design requests or video requests, any sort of development requests, et cetera. Now, in terms of just going into the little bit of automation that we do have within the system, um, it's this, we do use a Kanban style board to track our entire content pipeline. And I'll show you that in a few slides. But these are the different stages that we take our content through. Um, as soon as you move it from like, as you, as soon as you change the, the labels on a particular task, it automatically gets moved from, uh, one board to another. You can also set up automations where every board has a specific, um, key stakeholder. So if I move it from say refresh queue to outline, it gets assigned to me. And when I move it from outline to assigned writer, it gets assigned to a roster of writers. So a lot of automation you can play around with in here as well. And. This is a zoomed out version of what our content pipeline looks like. And I, the reason I wanted to show you this is because this is how much work goes into organizing um, just the blog at Nextiva. You know, we're, we publish around like two to three posts a week. It was a lot higher before when we started, uh, but right now th this is the cadence that we think it works for us. Um, another, another frequent question that I, I feel is, where do you put all your ideas? Is it on an Excel sheet? Is it on a doc? Do you share it on Slack with your team? This is where it goes and it, it's not where it goes to die. It, it thrives there. We add all um, sorts of context there. We add keyword research, uh, commentary from the team, uh, competitive resources, et cetera, and the ideas backlog board. It goes into the uh, outline assigned to writer board uh, when we think we're ready to move and create a new piece of content. 
if it's an existing piece of content that needs to um, be refreshed, then it goes into the refresh queue. And then it, you know, editing, design queue on deck. And there's one more queue that I wasn't able to uh, show here on the screenshot, and that's the published and archived. And if you're looking at this and if you're wondering how you can replicate something like this for your system, then these are the four questions that you need to ask yourself. What does your existing flow look like? Um, what are the different steps in that flow that you, you can count as milestones? How do you improve that? And who's accountable at each step? Now we're moving on to, I know we're kind of breezing through some of these topics, but um, yeah, Cotton Brief is one of my most favorite topics to talk about, especially because it's, it's a skill I think that I picked up organically uh, about three years ago is when I started working on Briefs when I fully owned the Sales Hacker contributor blog. And we're talking about managing 100 partners at a time. And I was the only internal gatekeeper. It was ridiculous to say the least to try and get um, you know, drops from everybody, make sure that they're following your editorial style guide, that you need to work in on page SEO into it. You need to make sure that this is actually going to get you traffic or, you know, has a reason for existence. And so this is the template that I used. Um, it was not as advanced back then, but this is my best version today. And this has a mix of both on page as well as uh, content brief uh, tips in it. And there are eight things that I want to go over real quick. Um, context, which is the target keyword related asana task is so important for us and um, in house writers or external, they're very integrated into our content operation system. They have limited view, but like relevant view into what they're working on, why it matters. Topic research docs, it could be anything from your clear scope reports, market news reports to original reports that you've worked on. Um, the introduction, this particular content brief I prepared keeping in mind that it's going to be a product led content, which is why those four questions are, what opinion are you for or against for this piece? Is it more specific than what you see on SERP? And what product or service uh, can you lead with? And is there a potential to drop your CTA there? Um, I know that's against some of the general advice that goes uh, into blogs where people only have inline CDAs or end of the blog CDAs, but we all have to admit there are very few blogs that people read from top to bottom. And so whatever you can organically sprinkle in your CD, that's the way to do it. And another thing that I want to quickly touch upon, it would be the images and videos part of things. Uh, a cool screenshot I will show you in the end, which touches upon a few things uh, with videos as well. But um, images, original images are a great way to get natural backlinks. It's not utilized enough. And I can't stress this enough. You do have the bandwidth to uh, engage with an agency outside or hire a full-time uh, marketing designer to help you with this, please do that. There's no better way to get backlinks. Videos as well is such a cool thing that if you can make in-house, there's no beating that. Um, and some other things that obviously you need to include in your outline is, um, sorry, brief is your competitor content, state of funnel, target ICP, other on-page SEO elements you wanna mention. For example, we always uh, urge our writers to go into Hemingway editor and make sure that um, they have uh, seven to eight sort of readability score on there and ballpark length, you know, where do you want this, uh, how in-depth do you want this piece of content to be? And the final thing I want to talk about content base is that your content brief is not an outline. This is just instructions to help your writer do their job better. It's not, it's not an outline where they, you're going to give them the entire narrative. And now uh, it's that screenshot I was talking to you about from the beginning. So this is a non-written example that I can think of, of a project that we worked on. Uh, it includes a lot of different elements from the content operation system that I was talking to you about. So we realized that, you know, we were producing all of these amazing um, educational product videos. Our YouTube was taking off. And uh, at the same time, we thought we did, we did have the counterpart sitting on the blog. And we decided that we would make a list of all the different um, videos and topics and map them to each other. Uh, we work with our video team to create nice, you know, intro and exit slides. The entire video is, looks highly um, professional, high quality production. And we work with our developers to get the video schema inserted into all of our, um, you know, those relevant uh, blogs that we'd map this into. And you're looking at three months, three months screenshot of that, the impact that it made. You're looking at almost a 300% growth in clicks just by doing that just by connecting the dots, you know, it was already something that existed and all we did was just piece it together so that, uh, you know, 
it's getting more views everywhere. We're getting more clicks on the blog and we're getting more engagement with YouTube and our channel has been growing and we've also been getting uh, rich snippets on SERP because of this. The reason I brought this together is you can only identify gaps like this when you have full visibility into your content pipeline and you know where to make tweaks. And so um, I'm just gonna wrap up with, you know, just a quick view again into what I mean when I say content operations engine. Uh, it can take you from chaos and ad hoc guesswork to something that's efficient and fast and it keeps you productive. Um, and just to like summarize again, uh, execution matters. In fact, it's, it's, it is the key to um, creating really good content. It doesn't matter if you have the best you know, research documents or you, you're really good at technical SEO audits or um, all these other fun stuff in the jazzier side of content SEO. But if you don't know how to execute it and if you don't know how to execute it every single day, you're not gonna see the results. So that's it. Lena, that was amazing. I feel like we just got a, a free consulting session for our agency, so that was <laughs> so valuable. Um, there was one question, uh, from the audience. So we've got, all right. So thank you for a fantastic presentation. What two to three priority positions would you recommend for a content marketing team at a small to medium SaaS company? Uh, so sort of, uh, 100 ish employees. Yeah, sure thing. I think uh, number one definitely would be the content editor role. Um, that person to me, it almost sounds like a unicorn. Um, but it's, it's a role that. And I guess it's very close to my heart because that's a role that I evolved into. But this person can manage so many different pieces of your puzzle. Uh, they, know the, um, they know the product, they know the industry, they know how to hire well. And so even if they can't do the actual execution um, in the weeds every day, they know how to piece it all together and can be a really good quality filter for you. The second role I think would be a subject matter expert, especially if you are selling a product you need somebody who knows the product and the technology that runs behind it better than you. And in our case, it's such a technical industry, VoIP. Um, there's no way, I can't even kid myself and be like, I'm an expert in VoIP. I, I don't think I will ever be an expert in VoIP. You need to know computer networks, you need to know jitter, latency, things like that. So somebody like that who can be a close partner, who's passionate about getting or educating the user is important. And I think the third person would be just like a general, um, if you do have the bandwidth to get an in-house writer, that's great. If not, just use that money to work with an agency because I think that's just more flexible. Um, if not, a content creator. Uh, everybody's creating content. Everybody's creating blogs. And I feel like now's the time to just switch a little bit and create other types of content. You know, we're talking about video bites or just um, illustrations and um images that can show the value of your content. So instead of doubling down on like 2000 word guides from day one, think about how you can make it easier to consume that same content, but like in smaller ways that are visually more appealing. So like a general, a generalist content creator type of role who can do a little bit of video, a little bit of graphics, things like that. I love it. And I definitely rec or agree with your recommendation for hiring an agency. So <laughs> not biased whatsoever. Uh, thank you very much. That talk was amazing. We got a ton of value from it. Thank you. Thank you for having me.